With sincerest gratitude, I celebrate David's heart today. The interior of his homes have obviously been described as maximalist, and I believe that's a very apt description of his heart as well. For those he loved, his heart was the biggest, grandest room we'd ever inhabit. To wander that space, often in those extraordinary late night phone calls while he was drawing, that was an exceptional thing. I am incredibly grateful to have found shelter in his heart for more than 50 years. There's no amount of wealth or power or perfection that could rent that room. He accepted my flaws and frailty. I was simply and astoundingly fortunate. His heart was a place of fearless excess. In David's heart, more was more. I absolutely counted on the constancy of his friendship which led me to take it for granted at times, and I won't make that mistake again. Today and always, I will celebrate my great good fortune of having lived so long and so well in David's grand and splendid heart. David Schofield was a true Renaissance man. A brilliant mind, a copious reader of many subjects, a lover of music, opera, philosophy, antiques, porcelain, sculpture, travel, the ocean, and the natural beauty of the world. He was a wonderful writer, although he never acknowledged it. His own work as an artist is unsurpassed. His dedication and philosophy for reconstructing antiques and porcelain from the past is grounded in the belief that rescuing these artists, these objects, is an obligation so that these works of these artists could come alive again. David was a wonderful storyteller and he had lots of stories to tell that he gathered from his travels during his life and his long-term relationships. An afternoon or an evening with David was always stimulating and delightful for sure. I never wanted them to end. But this was true for any time that I spent with David. We've been close friends ever since he moved to South Florida, closer than before. He was my confidant. He was my compassionate, non-judgment ear for when I had troubles and celebrated with me when the joyous times came. This is from a poem by Henry Scott Holland. I am but waiting for you for an interval somewhere near, just round the corner. All is well, nothing is hurt, nothing is lost. One brief moment and all will be as it was before. How we shall laugh at the trouble of parting when we meet again. David is a part of me and will live within me for the rest of my days. May his memory be for a blessing. Hello. We all know that David was a creative genius and a scholar and that he had a tremendous affinity for history and more importantly, um, a love, or should I say an obsession for those tangible pieces of history, be they broken bits of porcelain, um, a carved leg from a table, a, uh, or an odd limb from a doll, um, they were all important to David. He once explained to me that these were important and he pulled out a piece of lace and described the number of hours and the expertise that it took to make it. And he asked me, how can I discard this? This was meaningful, it was important, it's representative of someone's life. And, and you know, he was, he was pet, petting it uh, with affection. And so David loved all of these items, but he, you know, any item that was painted, carved, woven, you know, to him it had been touched and loved by someone and as a result had meaning. And it had meaning in their life and it had meaning in his life as a result. And, um, you know, for each piece, David found humanity in that piece. And so today, you know, as we all wear our pendants uh, with David's, uh, lo you know, items hanging from them, I'm reminded of his humanity and am forever grateful for his friendship. 
I met David on the dance floor of Studio 54 in 1980. He was young and energetic and adorable, but no Twinkie. There was so much more to David. He became one of my very best friends. We took long walks together in Manhattan and he described the history of individual buildings. I miss David. We shared details of our relationships and so many things. Today, when I miss him, I sometimes wear this pink cashmere sweater that he gave me. It's a little stained at the bottom, but it gives me comfort. And I sometimes hold the goddess that he gave me for Christmas one year. With her came a note that said that she'd watch over me. And now that David is gone, I really need that. Thank you, my friend. I uh, am Taylor Politis, and I first met David in 2002 uh, during the summer uh, in the um, basement of a place called Jay's Hangout, uh, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, I was sitting on a, a set of bleachers um, reading a paper, and David thought that was unusual and struck up a conversation. And I'm sure um, there are a lot of you out there who met David in a similar way, him coming up and striking up a conversation in somewhat unusual circumstances. Um, and I spent a lot of time with David that summer and I really uh, loved getting to know him. And I also got to know Roy and become a part of the um, world that David had around him. And uh, knowing David being a part of that world was such a, a real privilege and uh, something I, I just loved that connection and his creativity and the beauty he made and the um, sort of bodiness and uh, ability to talk about anything and to say anything, um, his sense of humor, sort of wicked and uh, biting, um, his incredible knowledge, his incredible skill and his loyalty and devotion to the people he loved and um, the people that he kept close to him. And I uh, always looked forward to our phone calls while he was scratching away on his um, work, one of which is behind me here, one of my um, most prized possessions, um, something, a part of David that uh, I keep with me always. And I will miss him so much. He was such a beautiful and amazing uh, person and uh, such an incredible character, a human being um, unlike any other. And uh, the world is uh, really the less for, for his presence. And uh, I miss him and I know all of you do too. Um, so thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Michael Myers and these are remembrances of David. When I first met David almost 40 years ago, one of my early thoughts was, this guy is crazy. We were in Key West, and the first evidence was seeing his six by three foot drawings made with a fine rapidograph pen, each one months of work, and then seeing when and where he made them. Working in an unair conditioned studio all night, hovering over a drawing table, with only the few square inch section he was working on exposed, the rest covered by towels against his sweat. And David's working away all the while on hours long calls with friends in Europe and elsewhere. A bit out of the box, I thought. David is the most represented artist in our collection. The first piece we bought in 1984, Sheridan Square, uh, in New York, the site of Stonewall, while David was working, was showing at Hennock Gallery. His early pieces were all New York, and what was the first inkling that more was going on besides a charming, crazy artist was hearing David talk about the drawing subjects. He was an amazing student of, among many other things, the subjects of his art. Our next piece was another New York landmark department store, Ward and Taylor. Our gatherings with David were most often in Key West, usually together with Roy. Wonderful long evenings of food and drink and conversation, usually culminating in seeing David's recent work. Over time, with his drawings, he expanded beyond New York and drew things he found on his travel, for us including a pagoda from Beijing, holes of boats from Egypt, 
and from a couple years ago, a courtyard from Rome that is back over my shoulder. In more recent years, our more limited gatherings were with David and Milas, who were a great couple after Roy's passing. Yet drawing was only part of David's repertoire. For any of us who had seen his houses, we know this. He loved to take other people's cast-offs and renew them. For us, it is a wonderful sailing vessel from days of yore and a wonderful vase with shards ranging from Europe to Asia to America. While David was sick, a number of us participated in his journey through the journal that he kept. On February 22nd, he wrote down through his drugged clarity, for me at least, the clearest statement of what was going on inside his head, at least about his three-dimensional art. David sets the scene in the, in the piece where by the 1600s, the Chinese had invented porcelain which the Europeans loved but hadn't figured out, so that 400 years ago, a Dutch ship bringing porcelain from China to Holland sank, which was rediscovered some 20 years or so ago. And David writes, and salvaged from the ship what remained of hundreds of unbroken plates, thousands of shards, and I is the point of this ramble, I feel that metaphorically there is the lake of creation, which is drained by the river of use, emptying over the delta of detritus and beyond the ocean of oblivion. And I get to stand in that silty delta and to pick up pieces, a shard, a beautifully carved chair leg, a scrap of needlepoint, all these lovely bits made by name forgotten men and women long dead who if they had children who would even know their ancestor was a potter carved chair legs made exquisite if exquisite if now soiled needlework these people are my anonymous ancestors people like me who made their living from their hands people who in time will be forgotten and but for the scraps who would even know they ever lived so my house, I kind of really built as a shrine. Everything I've restored, I guess, in these sudden last few weeks, I generally and specifically am trying to, what? Make sense of it all. And if I take some broken bit nobody wants and make it pretty, make it interesting, so my long dead Chinese potter shard that lay on the ocean floor that I bought on eBay for $12, if I can make it into something somebody else will buy, and who knows, maybe treasure, so it lives another however long, I have sort of saved his, her life for at least another rotation of the, of the screw. So we can add Noble to the list of descriptors for David. Before closing, a few things. Mewes, what a great pair you and David made, and your contribution to his journey was a huge contribution to David's life. While I know you grieve his loss deeply, you have whole new chapters in front of you. So mourn David, but celebrate life. And Jenny, Mary, and Carol, you each were true heroes in this last chapter of David's life here. Thank you. David, you so enriched so many lives, and you were gone too soon. We all celebrate you. Hello, friends of David Schofield. We bring you this remembrance of Dave from Whitters Park in, near Billingshurst in West Sussex in England, uh, from a manor house that friends of ours and friends of Dave's and Milos was built 10, 15 years ago, where, in fact, two of three, actually, of Dave's wonderful pen and ink drawings reside. I met Dave about 35, 40 years ago in Key West at a dinner hosted by mutual friends and instantly liked his quirky energy. After dinner, he enthusiastically took us on a mid-evening bike ride to show us the odd, weird, and sometimes spooky things he loved about the island. Crazy nights on the disco floor at the Copa soon followed. And I met Dave almost 14 years ago, which was a few months before I moved in with Corbin. Dave was on the first of his many annual visits to stay with Corb and eventually us in Venice Beach. And he would time his month-long stays around three huge flea markets in Southern California, where some vendors would greet him with boxes of broken pottery pieces they had saved for him over the previous year. 
Our home was headquarters for Dave's California expedition, so he was often out and about seeing other friends in L.A. and spending some overnights in the desert or in the Bay Area. We would have a few dinners together with him, and we were happy to provide a base for him to regroup and tell us his stories. Paul and I would joke about getting ready for the Dave show when he was about to arrive with those elaborate and elaborated stories about his life's adventures. Dave had an uncanny knack of and craving for establishing serious connections, even if fleeting, with people he met who often had stories ripe for Dave to devour and retell. Dave would also use our place to pack up and ship the myriad things that he had purchased at the flea markets. Sometimes a few of those things, either too big to ship or carry as hand baggage, would take up residence with us until he figured out how to get them back to Florida. And some of his purchases became gifts to us for hosting him. To describe one example, Corbin received a call from an excited Dave who said, I found the perfect piece for your patio. It's an almost life-size, semi-broken, concrete statue of a Roman centurion. When Corbin asked if he had a picture of it to see if we would even like it, Dave replied, it's arriving on Friday. In other words, it was a done deal. Dave had hired a few guys to, li- to deliver and hoist the statue up a flight of stairs and deposit it on our patio where it remains today, and we love it. And we named it David. We got to see firsthand Dave's skill among many at repairing broken things. He was already staying at our house when we returned from Myanmar with an antique vermilion wooden offering bowl. Unfortunately, it had not survived the plane ride intact. Upon seeing the piece, Dave knew exactly how to repair it. Within a couple of hours, he had epoxy glued and repainted the offering bowl to its original condition. We're also the proud owners of two of Dave's exquisite pen and pen and ink drawings. At first glance, they're incredible architectural renderings. And when you look more closely, you see that Dave would sometimes insert references that lighten the mood amidst an otherwise austere backdrop. Through Dave's other work, like his broken pottery vases, it was clear that he was a steward and maintaining the handmade craftsmanship from artisans that came before him. One such vase that we owned arrived with four handwritten pages of notes about where each piece of pottery on the sculpture came from, including a riverbed in Hanoi and an outhouse in San Francisco. We were fortunate to stay with Dave and Milos at their home in Key West 10 years ago and then visit their new home in Coral Gables a couple years ago, and I was blown away by the elaborate and beautifully curated spaces Dave had created. Each room was densely populated with Dave's rescued treasures. Dave and I worked together to build a new website to showcase his drawings to replace the outdated website Roy had built, and I wanted him to migrate that showcase eventually to Flickr, which is easier to maintain and update, which sort of happened, although getting him to regularly provide me with images and information was as challenging as herding cats. And although Dave himself is no longer with us, we we miss him hugely. Dave's presence is real and it's constant. And to Milos, our hearts go out to you as you grieve the loss of your best friend and life partner. You were so important to Dave and he loved you immensely. You gave him the space and support he needed and wanted so he could be who he was in the world. And that was a huge gift for him and for all of us.